Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to, um, uh, I just pressed the consent button <laughs> to the recording. Okay. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, uh, to give a talk at this seminar. It's uh, wonderful to see so many familiar faces and I'm, I've really been looking forward to this. So I'll talk about point configurations and frame theory. So I'll give you an overview of the connections between the study of point configurations and certain problems in frame theory. And I'll also uh, state and give you sketches of proofs of some fairly recent results. So first of all, I would like to uh, dedicate this talk to the memory of Jean Bourguin. He has been gone for a year and a half now, and uh, it would be impossible for me to describe in an hour or two hours or even 10 hours the impact that he's had on my work and how I think about mathematics. So, okay, so let's begin. So, as we all know, so one of the oldest problems and most far-reaching problems of modern mathematics is the question of expanding function into linear combinations of sines and cosines. And uh, a while back, I found this absolutely wonderful quote by Bruce Hood, who is a clinical psychologist. He said that Fourier's theorem has all the simplicity and yet more power than other familiar um, explanations in science. Stated simply, complex pattern, whether in time and space, can be described as a series of overlapping sine waves and multiple frequencies and uh, various amplitudes. What I find wonderful about this quote is not only is it a, um, uh, is it a great tribute to what, uh, what many of us do from someone from a different area, but, um, I also find wonderful that the things that get brushed under the rug, in other words, whether it is actually possible to express everything as an overlapping sum of sines, sine waves, is, uh, encompasses probably 90% of my work. So I think that this quote is wonderful, both in terms of what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Anyways, uh, so what are some basic questions? So given a bounded domain, omega and rd, does L2 of omega possess an orthogonal or a res exponential basis. So basis of the form e to the two pi i x dot lambda, where lambda is in some set capital lambda. And we shall refer to such a set as a spectrum. Uh, more generally, given a compactly supported Borel me measure mu, does L2 of mu possess an orthogonal or a Reese uh, exponential basis or a frame of exponentials? In other words, we don't need to confine ourselves to domains in Euclidean space of positive Lebesgue measure, okay? And in this context, a frame simply means that there exists positive constants, little c and big C, so that the sum of the Fourier coefficient squared is bounded above and below by constant multiples of the L2 norm of the function squared uh, with respect to the uh, Hilbert space under consideration. So these are the basic questions that uh, we're going to discuss. Okay, there's another interesting related question, and that is given G in, in L2 of RD, does there exist a discrete set capital S in R2D so that G of X minus A, E to the two pi I X dot B, where the pairs A, B live in S, is an orthogonal or a Reese basis or even a frame for L2 of RD, okay? Uh, so the basis or a frame above is called the Gabor basis or a frame. And it's named after Danish Gabor, who is a Nobel laureate in physics. Um, uh, so who developed the concept uh, of holography in the middle of the 20th century, okay? And this is Danish Gabor. At some point, I discovered that I can uh, find images in, uh, of various sorts on the internet and incorporate them into my lecture, and this made me very happy, so I've been doing that ever since. Okay. All right, so, second, just trying to move the, okay. So orthogonal exponential basis. For a long time, the study of orthogonal exponential basis revolved around the Fugletti conjecture. And normally when people state conjectures, they write the year when it was born. But here I also uh, wrote the year when it died. It died in 2003 at the hands of Terry Tao. And I'm going to say a few more words about that later. 
okay? And what the Fogletti conjecture says is that if omega in Rd is a bounded domain, then L2 of omega has an orthogonal basis of exponentials if and only if omega tiles Rd by translation. Okay? And Fogletti proved that this conjecture holds if either the tiling set or the spectrum that generates the orthogonal exponential basis is a lattice. Okay? Now we know that lattices are rather special. Nevertheless, it was reasonable to conjecture at this point that there is this universal connection between tiling and spectra. And even though the Fogletti conjecture uh, was disproved by Terry Tao in 2003, uh, it holds in many cases and continues to inspire some very interesting research combining combinatorial, arithmetic, and analytic ideas. And one story that I never get tired of telling is that when Terry disproved this conjecture in 2003, I received a phone call from my friend, Michael Lacey, who said, well, did you see that Terry Tao disproved the Fugletti conjecture? And I'm, I must admit that I hung up on him. I told him, Michael, I'm busy. This is not April 1st. And then later I discovered that it was true and I had to call back and apologize. Anyways, the Fugletti conjecture died in 2003, but the question is still extremely compelling. And I'm going to say more about that uh, in a bit. Okay. So first of all, what is known and what is still left to be understood? The Fogletti conjecture holds for unions of intervals under a variety of assumptions. So this is a line investigation that was pursued by Isabella Laba and others. Okay. Uh, the Fogletti conjecture holds for convex sets in RD. And um, so this was proved in two-dimensional case by Nets, Getz, Terry Tao, and myself. And uh, the, it was proved in all dimensions by Nirlev and Matematolchi just last year. It's, it's a really, really beautiful paper by Lev and Matolchi. And it was previously established by, for convex polygons in R3 by by Rahel Grinfeld in your lab, just a couple of years before. Okay. Uh, the Fogletti conjecture does not hold in general in ZPD for D bigger than or equal to four. So there was an initial result by Tao followed by results by Farkash, Gonzakis, Matolchi, Ferguson, uh, Sadunafan, and others. Uh, this is in fact how uh, Terry Tao initially disproved the Fogletti conjecture. He first this proved it in, uh, for five-dimensional um, uh, vector spaces over Z mod three by explicitly constructing a set of size six, which has an orthogonal basis of characters, but which doesn't tile for the obvious reason that six cannot be divided into three to the power of five. Um, and then he used a really beautiful procedure to transfer his example into Euclidean space and dealing with the effects of modular arithmetic, okay? Uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the conjecture holds in ZP2, where P is prime. So this is two-dimensional vector spaces over Z mod P. And this is result due to Azita Mayeli, Jonathan Pakianathan, and myself in 2017. And ZP3 is sort of the last frontier in this direction. So tiling implied imply spectral was proved independently by Mihalis Kolonzakis and also by um, in a paper was about 17 authors resulting from a summer REU that uh, I ran with Jonathan Pakianathan and Jorgis Petridis in 2016. Um, but in the opposite direction, the situation is still not completely understood. So there are some partial results for small primes that were proved by uh, Birkelbauer, Fallon, Maieli, Villani, but the general case is still open. So this is the final frontier left in, in the context of vector spaces over Z mod P, okay? Uh, in terms of Gabor basis, uh, the following question is still largely unresolved. And this is a great source of annoyance to me because I really, really like this question. So for which sets E, in RD, does there exist 
a spectrum S in R2D so that the indicator function of E at X minus A, E to the two pi I X dot B is an orthogonal basis for L2 over D. There's a tremendous amount of interesting work by many authors in the case when the window function for Gabor basis is not an indicator function of a set, uh, but something a bit more manageable like a Gaussian. But in the case of indicator functions, there's very little that is known. Uh, there is the following result, however. This is, uh, this is a result due to Azita Maeli and myself from a couple of years ago. And this is if, uh, if the window function g of x is an indicator function of a, of a convex, symmetric convex set with a smooth boundary and everywhere non-vanishing curvature, and the dimension is not congruent to one mod four, which sounds like an absurd condition, but I will shed some light on it later. Then there does not exist an S in R2D, so that G of X minus A E to the two pi I X dot B is an orthogonal basis for L2 over R D. Uh, the case when D is congruent to one mod four is work in progress. And uh, so this is something that I'm hoping will be resolved very soon. Okay, um, so if K is a non-symmetric convex polytope, the existence uh, of an orthogonal Gabor basis was chi K is the window function was ruled out by Chung and Lai in 2008. So there's been quite a bit of recent activities, by recent I mean the last several years in this direction, but there's still much left to be understood. And while I'm not going to give you a sketch of this result, um, I'm going to uh, mention similar results. Uh, so, the, so, the, so the general thrust of the arguments uh, is going to be described. Okay, so connections with other interesting problems, uh, which is really sort of the main emphasis of this talk. So in 2001, uh, Netscat, Steen Peterson and I proved that L2 of the unit ball does not possess an orthogonal basis of exponential. So this answered the question posed by Ben Pugletti in 1974. And uh, how did we do that? Uh, suppose that e to the two pi i x dot lambda is an orthonormal basis for L2 of the ball. Then lambda is separated and it has density equal to the volume of the unit ball by the classical Burling density theorem. In other words, if such a set exists, it's a very nice and manageable set. So nothing terrible is going on, okay? And orthogonality implies that if you take any two elements of the putative spectrum, then the Fourier transform of the indicator function of the ball evaluated and the difference of these two elements is zero. And what this means is that the distance between any two elements of the putative spectrum is a zero of uh, Bessel function JD over two, okay? And so we know quite a bit about zeros of JD over two. They're uniformly separated, for example. And we can use this fact to conclude that if L2 of the ball does have an orthogonal basis of exponential, the number of the elements of the spectrum inside a cube of side length R is around R to the power of D, okay? This is just something that follows from density, while the number of distinct distances cannot possibly exceed a constant times R. This is simply because these uh, distances are zeros of the Bessel function JD over two, okay, up to the scaling two pi. So we have produced this remarkable set, which has R to the D elements in D dimensions, but the number of distinct pairwise distances is bounded above by universal constant times R. And here we run up against the Erdos distance conjecture, and uh, so in 1945, Paul Erdos conjectured that the set of size R to the D in D dimensions 
determines at least R squared distinct distances. So one squiggle means that we are ignoring constants. Two squiggles means that we're ignoring log logarithms. For example, in two dimensions, it is known that the number, number of distinct distances um, uh, cannot, uh, uh, in general, cannot be in general be more than R squared over square root of log R. But up to logarithms, R to the D points in dimension D should determine at least R squared distinct distances. This is the conjecture. This conjecture is in general still open in this form. The only case where it's been resolved is in, in the plane where in an absolutely brilliant paper, uh, Larry Guth and Nets Katz established this conjecture in, uh, in 2011. But, no, but notice that in order for us to obtain a contradiction, okay, in order for us to, to obtain a contradiction, we do not need R squared distinct distances from R to the D points. We just need to know that there is much more than constant times R distances. And this has been known since 1953. In fact, this was proved in the PhD thesis of Leo Moser. Okay? And this gives us a contradiction, which proves that the unit ball in dimensions two and higher does not possess an orthogonal basis of exponentials. Other proofs have been found since then. But one of the things that I found uh, useful about this argument is that the connection that it establishes with finite point configurations uh, has uh, proved to be applicable in a variety of problems in uh, frame theory, some of which I'm going to mention today. Okay. Okay, so Erdos integer distance principle. So we just saw that the Erdos distance problem is useful in establishing that L2 of the ball does not have an orthogonal basis of exponentials. But Erdos has many problems, okay, that he invented. And one of them, and this one is really, really beautiful. It comes up in, um, in uh, mathematics competitions quite often, is that if A in RD is, so suppose you have, a, uh, you have an infinite subset of RD, such that the distance set, the set of pairwise distances, is a subset of the integers. So every distance is an integer. Then A is a subset of a line. So this is not um, particularly difficult to prove in two dimensions. In higher dimensions, it's a slightly more involved argument, but it's not, but it's not all that hard either. And so what can we get out of this? Uh, so there's a related result uh, due to Misha Rudnev and myself from 2003. And what we proved is the following, is that if K is a bounded convex symmetric body with a smooth boundary, and everywhere non-vanishing Gaussian curvature. And we take e to the two pi i x dot a, a in capital A, be a set of orthogonal exponentials in L2 of k. So we're not assuming that it's a basis or anything. We're just taking in an orthogonal set. And the question is, how large could it possibly be? And what we prove is that, is that if d is not congruent to one mod four, this is precisely the condition that arose in my result was Azita Maeli about the, uh, about the Gabor basis, about the non-existence of the Gabor basis was the window function being the indicator function of the ball. So if D is not congruent to one mod four, then A is finite. If D is congruent to one mod four, A actually may be infinite, but if it is infinite, it's a subset of a line and this ties back in to the Erdős integer distance principle. Okay, so let me describe. Uh, uh, so let me describe how this works. The Fourier transform of the indicator function of a nice uh, uh, symmetric convex set with a smooth boundary and non-vanishing curvature uh, has this form. So it has decay of order minus d plus one over two. And it has this sign plus a small error. Okay. Now this rho star over here is just a dual functional to the Minkowski functional that defines the convex body. 
Okay. So the idea here is that uh, we can deduce from this by a direct calculation that if two exponentials are orthogonal in L2 of k, then this rho star distance, this is a generalized distance, it's a norm, in fact, uh, uh, between a and a prime is up to a, a small error, a shifted integer. And remember, the Erdős uh, integer distance principle says that if you have an infinite set and all the distances are integers, then, um, then the set is a subset of a line. It turns out that this principle still works if you replace the Euclidean norm by a more general smooth norm. And if you replace the condition that the distances are integers by a condition that the distances are merely asymptotically integers. Okay, And this allows us to say that if you have an orthogonal set, an infinite orthogonal set in L2 of a convex body with a smooth boundary and unvanishing curvature, then it must be a subset of a line. So once again, a, a geometric combinatorial principle allows us to deduce a considerable amount of information uh, about the structure of orthogonal sets. Okay. So there is another approach to the study of orthogonal basis. And this one uh, is uh, via another point configuration problem, a very, very important one, that was introduced by Furstenberg, it's Nelson and Weiss. Okay, and uh, so they proved in 1986 that if you take a subset of RD of positive upper Lebesgue density, then there is a threshold beyond which you can realize every distance. So if you have not seen this problem before, what you should try to visualize is take an integer lattice and thicken every point by one over a million, say, okay? then you, will not, you may not be able to realize all small distances. For example, you're not going to realize distance one half, but you will be able to realize every sufficiently large distance. In the case of a lattice, this is a relatively simple number theory problem. But the first in Burkitt's Nelson and Weiss result says that if you take any set of positive upper Lebesgue density, then every sufficiently large distance is realized. And let me give you an idea. So this is this is Hilo Furstenberg. And let me give you an idea of how this result can be used to disprove the existence of orthogonal um, Let me first mention that there is um, that there is an, a more general version, in fact, a much more general version of Furstenberg, it's Nelson and Weiss result. And this is indeed one of the one of the deepest and most far-reaching results in the study of finite point configurations and is due to Tamar Ziegler. And Tamar Ziegler showed that if you take a set of uh, positive upper Lebesgue density and you take its delta neighborhood, then inside this set you can realize a dilate of any k-point configuration, okay, regardless of the size of k. And um, there's some work in progress currently to exploit this result in the context of frame theory. I'm not going to say anything about it today, but I hope to be able to say something in the near future. Uh, this result by Stiegler, um, it should be noted as a special case, implies the celebrated Zamoretti theorem uh, about uh, arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length in subsets of the integers of positive density. Okay, so this is really perhaps the most uh, general result available in this, uh, on this subject matter. All right, so let's see how the, how the first of Burkitt's Nelson Weiss Ziegler problem applies to uh, the results we are talking about. So let's say we again return to the problem of the unit bow. Oh, I just saw Paula, hello. Um, uh, applies to the case of the unit bow in RD. So suppose that e to the two pi i x dot lambda is an orthonormal basis for L2 of the ball. Then once again, lambda is separated and has density, which is the volume of the ball, by the classical Berlich density theorem. So now thicken each point of lambda by a small delta. This immediately gives you a set 
a positive upper Lebesgue density in Rd. And by the Furstenberg, it's Nelson Weiss result, every sufficiently large distance is realized, okay? Except that this cannot be true. We have already seen that in the case of the ball, the distances between elements of lambda before we thicken it are zeros of the Bessel function JD over two. And that implies that they're asymptotically close to half integers shifted by D minus one over A. Now, if you thicken lambda, that would mean that the distances are constant delta close to half integers shifted by D minus one over A. So it is still impossible to recover every sufficiently large distance. This is an extremely flexible method that applies not only to the existence of orthogonal basis, but also the uh, existence and non-existence of uh, Gabor basis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. So uh, in fact, using this uh, Furstenberg, it's Nelson Weiss, Ziegler setup, we can prove a bit more about L2 of the ball. So we know that L2 of the ball does not possess an orthogonal, orthogonal basis of exponentials. But um, uh, quite recently, in fact, less than a week ago, um, Azita Maieli and I proved a bit more. And we call it a phi approximate orthogonal basis for L2 of omega if it's a basis. And we no longer insist that the Fourier transform on the difference of two elements of the spectrum is zero. We simply insist that it's bounded by phi, some function phi of the distance from lambda to lambda prime. And this phi is some continuous function that vanish at infinity, vanishes at infinity, okay? And what we can prove is the following. What we can prove is take any function which, um, which, over, which overpowers one plus t, d plus one over two. In other words, which decays a little bit faster than the order minus d plus one over two. This is the order at which the Fourier transform of the indicator function of the ball decays. Then there does not exist a set lambda such that L2 of the ball possesses a phi approximate orthogonal basis, E of lambda. In other words, um, uh, not only doesn't L2 of the ball possess an orthogonal basis of, of exponentials, nothing even reasonably approximate is going to work. Okay? And when I say reasonably approximate, I really mean that because the Fourier transform uh, of the indicator function of the ball already decays of order minus d plus one over two. So if you take anything even a tiny bit faster, it is not going to work. All right, and the proof is, uh, is, uh, is an application of the principle that I just described in the case of the ball. I mean, the problem has certain technicalities when, uh, when you use uh, phi approximation, but the basic idea remains similar. Okay, uh, so what I would like to do for the uh, remainder of the talk is to describe some results that are related uh, to my ongoing and largely unsuccessful efforts to prove that, L that um, L2 of the ball does not possess a Reese basis of exponentials. I'm never going to stop working on this problem and uh, I do not care how many times I fail, I'm going to keep trying. Okay, so this problem was posed probably in the 70s and to the best of my knowledge, there's been essentially no progress, though I'm going to report some results which I feel are suggestive. Okay, so does there exist an, uh, a Reese basis of exponentials for L2 of the ball? So uh, Lubarsky and Rashkovsky proved that L2 of k has a Reese basis of exponentials if k is a symmetric polygon inscribed in the disk. Actually, what they proved is a lot more, but the reason I wanted to state this particular result
shows that these perturbation methods are destined to fail because you can take a polygon, however large, inscribed in the disk, and it has a respaces of exponentials. Okay. So uh, as a contrast, in for example, in 2D, uh, Netscape's Terry Talon, I proved uh, that. Uh, if k and r2 is convex, then l2 of k has an orthogonal basis of exponentials if and only if k is a square or a hexagon. This, to me, I think is an excellent indication that the respaces problem is just much, much harder. Okay? And another result that really, I don't know how to say it, whether it blows my mind or just annoys me, but there are no known examples of sets E of positive Lebesgue measure such that L2 of E does not possess a Reese basis of exponentials. And what this does is that this is psychologically difficult because it creates a situation where we could wake up one day and find out that every set has, an, has a Reese basis of exponentials. I don't believe that this is true, but until somebody finds a counterexample, this is always going to be this nagging fear in the back of my mind. And so let me, as a build up to the, um, uh, to the results, uh, to the to the results I'm going to uh, discuss today, uh, let me remind you of the Kettis and Singer conjecture. So this was uh, formulated in the last 1950s, and it, and it arose out of Paul Dirac's work on foundation of quantum mechanics in 1940s. Okay, this is Kettis and Singer. So, um, So there's another sort of a uh, kind of a humorous story to me. So in uh, in uh, in graduate school, I took a really wonderful course on functional analysis, and uh, I really uh, loved the course and I loved the instructor, but it seemed abstract to me, and I swore that I would never have anything to do with this stuff, and I turned out to be wrong. Of course, many years later, uh, I I went back to looking at these things, and I very much enjoyed them. Um, Anyway, a state in a C star algebra a, is a continuous linear functional phi from A to the complex numbers. So the phi of, phi of identity is one and phi of T is bigger than or equal to zero for every T bigger than or equal to zero. Such a state is called, a pure, is called pure if it's an extremal point in the set of all states in A, okay? And by the Han Banach theorem, any functional on capital D can be extended to uh, capital B. Uh, Kettison and Singer conjectured that for the case of pure states, this extension is unique. Okay. And uh, as I think everybody in the audience here knows, this conjecture was open for a very, very long time, but it was finally resolved by, uh, by Marcus. Uh, Spielman and Srivastava. So this this is this is their photos over here, and what they proved is uh, they proved this result in the following equivalent form. And this equivalent form uh, makes it uh, much more plausible to sort of a hands-on harmonic analyst like me that this can be applied to something. Now I know there are many people in the audience who have no trouble believing that functional analysis statements of the general type are applicable. But to me, this was something that was difficult to accept for a long time. But once I saw the uh, statement in this form, I understood things much better. So Marcus Spielman and Srivastava proved that if epsilon is bigger than zero and u1 through um are vectors in Cn with, L2, with the norm squared less than epsilon and the sum of Fourier coefficients squared uh, equaling the, uh, the norm squared of omega, then there is a partition. So you can take one through m and partition it into two sets. So that if you sum the Fourier coefficients over each partition, it doesn't equal to the, the norm of omega squared, but it's bounded by a constant one plus square root of two epsilon squared over two times the L2 norm of omega square, okay? And this statement has found numerous applications. And one of them that particularly really caught my attention and really kind of captured my imagination for a while is a really nice theorem by Nitsan, Olevsky, and Olenovsky. So they proved that there exist positive constants, little c and big c, 
such that every set S and RD of finite measure, there is a discrete set lambda such that e to the two pi i x dot lambda is a frame in L2 of S with frame bounds little c times measure of S and big C times the measure of S. I think the uniformity in this statement is quite remarkable, okay? And a question, there's a question that arises from this uh, that is the following. So let's take mu delta to be one over delta times the indicator function of the annulus of radius one and width delta. You can apply the nietzsche olevsky ulanovsky theorem and find that there exists a constant, uniform constants, big C and little c, such that uh, there exists a frame, this should be delta bigger than zero, so that there exists a frame e to the two pi i x dot lambda, lambda and lambda delta, with these uniform constants, okay? And here's the question, what happens if you let delta go to zero? Now, I'm not saying that we are allowed to let delta go to zero, we're certainly not. But there's temptation to take delta go to zero and obtain a measure on a sphere, okay? So is it true that, uh, that L2 of sigma possesses a frame of exponentials, not a basis, just a frame of exponentials. And this is a question that was posed by Nir Lev a few years ago, and he pointed out that if you take a piece of a sphere, let's say above the equator, then by very simple projection methods, you can show that of course, the measure has a frame of exponentials. But if you take a whole sphere, uh, this uh, appeared to be a very different question, and it was recently resolved uh, by um, Lai, Lu, Wyman, and myself. And what we proved is that the Hilbert space L2 of sigma does not possess a frame of exponentials. So let me just say up front that I'm hoping to use this result as a springboard of another line of attack on the question of whether L2 of the ball has a Reese basis of exponentials. And I hope to be able to say something intelligent about that sometime soon. Okay, but this question is interesting in itself, so let's talk about this a bit. Um, so we also proved as a contrast that if K is any polytope in RD, not necessarily convex, and sigma K is the surface measure supported on the boundary, then L2 of sigma K does possess a frame of exponentials. Okay, so, uh, so the answer is no for, uh, for a sphere, and in fact, for any symmetric convex body with a smooth boundary and non-vanishing curvature, but the answer is yes for any kind of a polytope, okay? And uh, in the remaining 10 minutes or so, let me give you an idea of how uh, this result is proved, okay? Uh, we proved it by setting up a rather general framework, which has since then uh, led to, uh, to other results of related type, which I'm not going to describe today. But here, let me describe the framework. So first of all, here's our first theorem in the direction of establishing that L2 of the measure on the sphere uh, does not possess and uh, a frame of exponentials. So let mu be any compactly supported Borel measure. And suppose that L2 of mu possesses a frame of exponentials with the frame spectrum lambda. Suppose that you have a constant capital C and gamma between zero and D, so that the Fourier transform decays. So mu hat of C is bounded by a constant times norm C to the power of minus gamma over two, okay? So the measure in the sphere has nice decay. So this is, uh, so it, it's reasonable that this comes up. Then what we can prove is that if you take one over norm lambda to the gamma and you sum it over the spectrum with zero removed, you get infinity, okay? In other words, the existence of a frame of exponentials and the decay of the Fourier transform of, a, of the measure that we are working with 
uh, gives us a, some fairly precise information about how the elements of this putative frame spectrum are distributed. So, so the Fourier decay gives structural information right here. Okay. All right. On the other hand, we have the following result. So suppose mu is a finite Borel measure that admits a Bessel sequence. Okay, so we're not even assuming that it's a, a full frame. Uh, and with, uh, for some countable set lambda in RD. And here we assume, uh, so before remember, we assume that the Fourier transform is bounded above. Here we assume that, the, that a certain average of the Fourier transform is bounded from below. So, so what do we do? We take the Fourier transform squared, we uh, integrate it over a ball of radius r centered at the elements of the spectrum. We multiply it by norm lambda to the gamma. So uh, in the previous theorem, we assumed that the Fourier transform is bounded by norm c to the minus gamma over two, but this is squared over here. So this is a result in the opposite direction. And then we take the inf over norm lambda bigger than L and the soup over all the radii. And we assume that this quantity is positive. This tells us that if we now sum one over norm lambda to the power of gamma over the spectrum with the zero removed, we get a finite result. So as a contrast, in the previous theorem, we assumed the existence of the frame uh, and then a Fourier decay. And then we, we got to conclude that the summation of one over norm lambda to the gamma over the putative spectrum is infinite. In the second theorem, we assume a certain average lower bound than the Fourier transform. And this tells us that the summation of one over norm lambda to the gamma is finite. Obviously, both of these cannot hold. And the result about the sphere is uh, obtained that the assumptions of the two theorems above are satisfied uh, if gamma is equal to d minus one over two. In the first result, we simply use the well-known decay properties of the Fourier transform of the measure and the sphere. For the second result, uh, we use the asymptotics of the Fourier transform of the measure of the Fourier transform of the measure on the sphere and obtain this uh, lower bound rather easily. It's a rather routine multivariable calculus type calculation. The trick here was not the calculations used to, used to verify our result, but rather setting up the mechanism. Okay. And so let me just give you an idea of how this mechanism is set up, namely how we prove these theorems, because once you have them, applying them to this to a sphere and many other related objects is just a matter of a of a of a calculation okay okay so by assumption let's assume that there is an r bigger than zero uh so that uh you take the inf of norm lambda to the gamma and now this average decay of the Fourier transform and this is positive right so by assumption this c is bigger than zero also by assumption, mu hat of c plus lambda squared is less than or equal to a constant because we have an upper frame constant. Okay. And then we integrate both sides. And what do we obtain? So we, we integrate over the bow at minus lambda, mu hat of c squared dc. C. We sum over the frame elements. And this is just equals to rescaling integral of mu hat of c plus lambda squared over the bow and we sum over the elements of the spectrum. And this is just clearly bounded by R to the D. Okay. So if we invoke the definition of C, what we conclude is that C multiplied by the summation of one over norm lambda to the gamma uh, over the spectrum is bounded by R to the D and the game is over. This shows that the summation of one over norm lambda to the gamma is finite, okay? Now this finite bound depends on this capital R, 
but we didn't say that it was small. We're not giving a quantitative bound on this. We're just proving that it's finite. Okay. And now what do we do in the opposite direction? Okay, so now we're gonna assume the decay of the Fourier transform. And we are going to show that the sum of one over norm lambda to the gamma is less than infinity, okay? So what do we do? Since uh, lambda is a frame spectrum, we have this with constants above and below. Mu is normalized to be a uh, probability measure. Okay, fantastic. Uh, now you fix r bigger than one large, take norm lambda bigger than two r and norm c less than r. Then by the triangle inequality, we have norm lambda plus c is bigger than norm, norm lambda over two, okay? And now we just crunch. So what do I mean? Take mu hat of lambda plus c modulus squared over norm lambda bigger than 2r. Now use the decay of the Fourier transform. So here's where we use it. Norm lambda plus c to the minus gamma. It was gamma over 2, but the left-hand side is squared. And this is bounded by norm lambda to the minus gamma, okay? Because of, uh, because of the relationship between C and lambda, it's much smaller, okay? So since the sum is finite, you can take R large enough so that the summation of mu hat of lambda plus C modulus squared is less than some constant over two because the sum is finite, okay? And so if R is large enough, if you now sum over the small frequencies, less than or equal to two R of mu hat of lambda plus C modulus squared, it is bounded below by a constant divided by two, okay? And so then what happens is we simply integrate this inequality over the ball of radius R. And what we obtain is that R to the D by going through the intermediate steps that we just went through is bounded by the number of elements of lambda in the ball of radius 2r centered at the origin times the integral of mu hat of c squared over this ball of radius 3r, okay? And now we apply the Fourier decay condition again and we bound this integral of mu hat of c squared over the large ball by r to the d minus gamma, if gamma is smaller than, this is the range that's relevant to us. And log r, if gamma is equal to d, this is interesting, but not for the problem we are discussing, okay? And from this, we conclude that the number of elements of lambda in a bow of radius 2r is bounded from below by r to the power of gamma, if gamma is smaller than d. So now this is just calculus. Okay, so why is this just calculus? The condition follows. So the claim is that if the number of elements of the spectrum in the bow of radius 2r is bigger than or equal to r to the power of gamma, then there is no way summation of one over norm lambda to the power of gamma uh, is, uh, uh, is summable. The sum will have to be infinite. In other words, this is true for exactly the same reason that the integral of one over norm x to the d in d dimensional space diverges. It just misses by a logarithm because the density is just off. And this establishes the result. So let me go back for a very quick summary. The result uh, that the L2 of the sphere or, or of, of a boundary of any smooth convex body with non-vanishing curvature does not possess a frame of exponentials is obtained by showing that the Fourier condition uh, and the frame property uh, imply, that the, imply that the summation of one over norm lambda to the gamma is infinite, which says in some ways that the spectrum is, frame spectrum is large, okay? And at the same time, proving that, uh, that, the lower, uh, that the lower bound on average Fourier decay also holds, which allows us to prove that in some sense, the, uh, the frame spectrum is small and the resulting contradiction establishes the result. As I mentioned before, what I'm hoping 
what I'm hoping to do eventually is to understand the connection between this result and the existence of the exponential release uh, basis on the ball. And uh, so, as I said, I hope to be able to say something about that in the future. I think I'm going to stop here.